Well, hello and welcome back to MR Realities. Uh, Market Search Realities is a podcast that my good friend Kevin Gray up in Tokyo and I, Dave McCocken, hit sitting here in steamy Bangkok, put together where we talk to some of the world's leading experts in market research, insights and areas around that. So, Kevin, do you want to introduce today's guest? Yeah, Mikel Amora, who's uh, uh, from the Dallas-Fort uh, Worth area, at least uh, today, originally from Cuba. You have quite an interesting uh, background uh, that we we don't have, uh, we could cover in more than 40 minutes, but since uh, you personally are not the topic today, uh, UX is our topic. Uh, but to start off, could you just very, very briefly give us some background on, you know, who you are, where you came from, what you do, so forth? Sure. My name is Michaela Mora. I am the founder and president of Revan Insights, it's a market research and user research agency located in the Dallas area in Texas. And my goal has always been to help clients make effective and profitable decisions based on both qualitative and quantitative research. After I got my degree in psychology, I went into the market research field in which I have been now for more than 30 years in different market research roles in both the agency and the client side, like Blockbuster and Match.com, in three different countries, Cuba, Sweden, and the U.S. Uh, With more periods of formal education in market research, marketing, PR, advertising, and lately in the area of user research from an interaction design perspective. I started Relevant Insights at the end of 2007, just at the door of the Great Recession. Yeah, same with me. Uh huh. And have been in business now for 13 years. Yeah, yeah. I guess I guess we have something going for us since we've survived. Uh, <laughs> I, I I enjoy reading these articles saying that you know that the companies that were founded during the Great Depression are still with us. <laughs> <laughs> and those who were founded during boom times are no longer. So it sounds like among the three of us, we have about a, a hundred years collective experience, not to date ourselves too much. But anyway, UX, uh, if I'm an ordinary, you know, business guy, uh, could you tell me what that is? It, it sounds like a flying saucer to me. Well, UX stands for user experience, which covers all aspects of the end user's interaction with the company, its services, and its products. This is different from a user interface, which is important to the experience, but not the same. So you may have a beautiful, elegant, but totally useless interface, which can generate a bad experience. This is also different from usability, which is an attribute of the user interface. This is about where the systems are easy to learn, efficient to use, easy to use. So UX goes beyond the interface and its usability. It is the result of the total combination of the technology, the content, the interaction, the aesthetics that people experience from all touch points. And it is in fact, the user experience happens every time a customer interacts with a product or services while choosing the product or service, acquiring it, learning to use it, actually using it, or fixing the product or service if there is a repair needed, upgrading it, and even canceling the service or disposing of a product. All that is part of user experience. So how how would it differ from, uh, from CX or from customer satisfaction? Well, it has to do with the history of this, uh, bo- both terms. So the term user experience started being used in 1993 by Don Norman at Apple when they figured that the experience of using the Apple computers was weak in his, in his own words. And he was referring to the experience of when you first discover the product, when you use it in the store, when you buy it when you try to fit it in the car to bring it home, when you open the box and try to put all the parts together. So they were looking at all the touch points between the user and the product, including when when they talked about the product. So they even created the user experience architect department at Apple. 
Uh, Don Norman is one of the co-founders of the Norman Nielsen Group, which does both research and training in the field and have contributed to this expansion. Uh, to be fully transparent, I am personally done, I have personally done a lot of training with them and have a master's certification with focus on user research and interaction design from the program. But the field has roots in the science of human factors, which started in ergonomics, which studies the interaction of humans and elements of a system. And systems can be any working system designed to support human performance. So you will find applications in engineering and healthcare and workplace design, education and others. And it also intersects with psychology. And it says that Bell Labs was one of the pioneers of the field where they, when they hire uh, psychologists to design the telephone systems in 1945 and produce the first touchstone keypads. So the field has gone through several growth spurts driven by technology that has changed how people buy and use products. So one of them was the first arrival of the personal computers and many new software applications in the 80s. And the internet it was the second one, big one, and, and the, with the web explosions in the 90s and the 2000s. So in many categories, you had and still have to buy first then discover how the product will work and it's still, you know, if it is easy or not to use. But in e-commerce, at least part of the experience happens before people buy. The website experience has often, has often a, a huge impact on buying decisions and becomes part of the whole product experience. And so in contrast with, for example, the mainframe computers with personal computers, software and in, on software, the buyers and the users started to be the same, which created an incentive to produce better user interfaces. So in 2001, a group of developers got together and wrote the Agile Manifesto, which has been forgotten and misinterpreted by many now, but it was meant to provide principles to get away from the waterfall product development model, which works in sequential phases without feedback from users until the final product was launched. So you spend years developing a product, you launch it and then discover that people have problems using it. So Agile in this context was about being flexible and making changes based on user feedback before finalizing the product in order to meet the user's needs. Unfortunately now, Agile has become synonymous with faster, cheaper product development, often ignoring the users, but I digress. So the digital revolution really led to an interest in the field, but mostly from those who were involved in product design and development, which is why you see the UX acronym attached to many designer and developer job titles. Unfortunately, since these groups don't really have a training in research, the quality of user research, despite of being essential to UX has suffered greatly and is sometimes uh, totally absent in UX. The difference is mainly, there is a large debate about, about the difference between UX and CX. Are they different, are they the same, should it be the same? The difference comes from the history, how they originated. The UX come from the human factors and product development, while CX is just another modern name for the old voice of the customer customer satisfaction programs, and they are used by different teams depending on the company. So some live in a kind of quantum physics parallel universe. They don't talk to each other. They <laughs> live in their own little worlds. And the UX people often are closer to product development and design, and the CX people are closer to marketing, sales, and operations. So CX is seen in the context of customer acquisition and retention and tries to measure satisfaction and loyalty and the NPS and at a very, very high level. It includes product satisfaction, but it doesn't satisfaction but doesn't get into the actual product use many times. So this mm -hmm. is where you find many market researchers. While UX is often associated with behaviors related to product use and design. And this is where you find the designers and the product managers and the developers. And, but for me, they are again, they are lenses to look at users. 
your users are your customers, your customers are your users. People don't really separate in their mind their product experience with the experience that they have with their brand messages and the customer service and all that. That is why people may decide to stop using your product because the company or brand doesn't align with the personal, the personal values and purpose in products and services. Products and services have both functional and emotional benefits and functional benefits are related to what the product actually does and how allows you to get the job done. Say a car allows you to move from point A to point B, but the emotional benefits goes beyond the functional and speak to how using the product makes you feel. A luxury car can make you feel special at another level beyond the functional features. So functional and emotional benefits often play together, but they may weigh differently on your experience, depending on the touch point in the experience. So you can easily contact customer service, not get your problem solved and be treated so well that you don't mind the problem went unsolved for a moment. And you can also be enamored with your product, how your product works, and you will forget a company, you know, forgive a company, the occasional missteps. So and at the same time, there are other instances in which it takes a tweet with the wrong message for people to dump your product. So the separation of the terms is an artifact of the origin history, but the fact is that consumers and users are the same. And I always suggest thinking of this term as different lenses to look at the same object. Mm -hmm. Sorry for the long answer. <laughs> no, 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 brilliant. That was uh, an excellent summary. So do you find then that, that uh, the, the type of industry or perhaps a uh, different culture, uh, national culture has uh, much of an influence on, on this? Um, I think it has to do ma mainly with the industry more than anything. The UX area has grown, expanded more in the digital realm because that's where product development, that's where the Agile Manifesto, for example, mm -hmm. originated and that's where more interest got into it, right? And, that's, and they think also that this area, people in this area think this is new, this is not new. There's, this has been happening for a long time, even in the physical world, but the physical world moves you know, slower because yeah. of, of the cost, the fast cost and the fixed cost that are in, in, you know, included in this. So you see that more in, in software development and um, e-commerce, that's where you have seen the, the explosion. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Dave, did you, I've been doing. Yeah. So when you talk about user experience and the, the way it sort of developed, I, I was interested in what you were saying about agility and um, the way sometimes agility is get, gets misused today um, or misreferenced. But how do you think um, that has all affected the, or give us some examples of how that then has affected what we've, market research and what goes on in the market research world? Well, I think the market research world has been a little bit disconnected from this just because structurally many times market research has been more associated with marketing and even if, when they are involved in, for example, new product testing, it's a very high level appeal and, and and some more when they do it many times is using quite quantitative methods. But now lately, when you hear there is a lot of interest in, for example, qualitative research because of interest in the experiences has been expanding from, from the digital to the physical more and realizing, okay, we need to really, you get a lot of insight by watching people. So it's a lot of mm. interest again in ethnography and digital ethnography. And it's, they are the same principles because, you know, you have to think that user experience is beyond the actual product use. So when the interaction, whatever that is, meets the needs of the customer without much effort, the customer will have a good user experience. There is also an element of joy in the interaction, a joy to own 
to use a product or service will also lead to a good user experience. That's mm. kind of hard to capture in surveys. So you, the qualitative research methods lend themselves better to actually observe what is really happening, how people are really using products, how they interact in, and how they interact in with other areas beyond the product, with the company, with the customer service, with all the different touch points that the company has. So you can have good user experiences, for example, happen when people can accomplish essentially what they need to do, what is important to them, when they easily figure out how to use the product, when they have easy access to it through whatever technology is available, when they have fun and when they find it appealing, when they receive the information that allows them to enjoy the product, to understand how it works, helps them to make the right decisions think in terms of you know, manuals and tutorials and Q&A here. But beyond the product and service, when they are able to connect with the company, providing the product or service and get the questions answered or problem solved, on the other hand, bad user experience is often present when customers don't know how to use the system to do what they must do, causing them stress and frustration. And when they don't know where to start, how to use the different features that are available, they leave them confused. Also, when they look at boring and an appealing presentation of products and services, which is why packaging, it, packaging is so important, but especially when they feel forced to engage with features that are irrelevant to what they are trying to accomplish, making the whole process inefficient. So they may spend time, too much time and effort trying to do something. And they can do things in the most logical way for them, forcing them to do in the way designers have decided, you know, the mm. thing, how things should yeah. work. And finally, yeah. when they feel treated in a condescending or a disrespectful manner, which goes beyond the product and service and touches how the company communicate with customers, many of those things, we, we, in market research, we touch some of those areas with customer satisfaction surveys and, and some general attitudes and usage research, but really you have to go deeper and, and get into the actual observing people, what they do and how they react. And we have been slow in that area because that has been monopolized by designers and developers. They have been forced to do it because in product development companies, they say, well, now you will have to be, you know, you have to talk to your users essentially. And they do it, whatever. They don't have any really training in research. So you can, you hear the questions if you go to those Facebook in groups when they discuss this you can ask the questions you realize that people don't know research but they are trying to do the best they can mm. because there's no really formal education in this area do you that's, find that's, that that's... You go ahead, Dave. i was going to say i find that really interesting you know i can't help as you were talking about that thinking about the uh, the user experience of from a user's point of view of actually being part of the market research process so, you know, I, I find it really interesting because I, I, I do, the, as a side interest, the way in which research companies try to understand who is using or who is filling out their surveys or who's participating in their different pieces of research. And the user experience is usually awful um, in <laughs> itself. <laughs> yeah. um, you know, uh, my little bugbear at the moment is there's one particular panel company that I purposely joined the panel five years ago last week. I have so far uh, applied to, they send me these notices, you know, about you can complete a survey today. Um, and I have probably responded, I think over 200 times in the last five years and only once have I ever actually completed the survey because they keep on cutting me off. Now, you know, normal people, of course, would not return. I'm doing it because it's like, an, you know, a hobby of mine now to find out what it takes to actually get to complete a survey. Mm -hmm. um, but so I'm interested in what you're thinking, you know, if you could just, you know, a little bit more about the actual user experience of doing uh, of, of market research itself, as in from the user's experience, you know. And do, do, do you think market research companies actually do? Uh, think about user experience? 
The try, but the, the, I think there are two elements here. One is the actual questionnaire design, mm. right? And which, unfortunately, in our industry, with the do-it-yourself uh, trends, there's a lot of people who really don't have the foundations in research writing surveys. And mm. so you see a lot of bad service written by people who don't, don't know how to do it. There are forces related to budget. And because when a company has not done research in a while or ever, if they decided to do one, they want to do everything in one. They wanted to ask all the questions that for 30 years they have kept in the vault. And now is the time to ask them. And so they come with this long list of questions. It's very hard. And I have been in that position many times to come back to the client and say, okay, this survey is taking now 30 minutes and we need to cut. It is really painful and some clients really resist and resist and resist because they don't want to say, they don't want to spend the money to say, okay, let me be doing two waves. Now we do this set and now the next time we did two set because they have, they have their lines they have to meet and the, their budget. Then there is the other technology area it has to do with the actual survey tools and I have I have evaluated many survey tools if you go to my website you see I have the little uh, online survey review center which <laughs> for a while I was I was trying it, it's just time consuming but I, ha I have reviewed many survey tools and those survey tools they are developed by programmers and designers they're not necessarily researchers so we have the same issue with mm. developing tools to do research that are not necessarily developed by researchers. And you can, you'll be amazed by the amount of features. You can see where the companies put their money. They develop very cool features that nobody uses. They are totally relevant, but they're really mm. cool. And then there are other things like so basic that they need, like randomization, please. <laughs> Keep Keep the known of the above at the bottom and the other at the bottom. No, you cannot do that. Either you randomize all or nothing. And things like that, right? And then you realize those people who develop these tools really don't know research. And if you go, for example, there is a lot of technology development in the qualitative field, a lot of data capture tools to capture video and particularly for ethnography. So there is Many, many tools, very good ones, very good interfaces for the user. So the user can really, you can specify what you want and you can capture the data. But the headache comes afterwards when the researcher has to sit with that data. And then you have to spend hours and hours to put it together in a way that is usable for analysis. And when you look at that, you realize that those people don't know anything about database development and design and how you do data analysis, even if it's qualitative, because this is, there is this idea that because it's qualitative, it can come in any format. Mm -hmm. So you get, you know, you do 30 interviews and all of them come in one spreadsheet, one after the other. It's like, how am I going to do this? I need to at least put it in one, one spreadsheet per person. No, it's just, it's awful in the back end. And I have talked to a couple of, of those developers and, and they know they, they try, but it's just, you need to have researchers really involved in the design process and that they should be using the same methodology that is used for developing other products, any product, either for the technology and for the questionnaire development. Unfortunately, there is also Clients don't have the money or the time to not willing to pay for an actually good questionnaire development, except for some academic institutions and government institutions that they, for example, they have been doing now a lot of, um, well, not now, but for years, what is called cognitive uh, interviewing, which is you use that methodology of asking questions about the questions just to make sure the you questions are understood mm -hmm. and the you mm -hmm. asking the right questions. So you are measuring whatever you say you're measuring, right? right? And the only place I have seen that's been practiced on a consistent basis is in the, the census, but the census 
you know, they have millions, so they can do, they, they have to do a lot of testing before they use one word, they do tons of testing. And so if I'm going to tell a client, okay, we have this survey, we need to test it with a, a few, we have pre-tested with serious, I have to pay those people, I have to recruit these people, I have to spend time doing that, and the clients don't want to pay for yeah. that. And so that's the, it's a cash 22, if you want quality, you need to pay for it. And since the advent of all the online survey tools, it became this notion that because there is the tool out there, it is kind of going to be doing everything for you. And I have been in meetings where, where people don't know anything about me, you know, PR and marketing people. And it was someone telling me it was a big meeting and she was questioning why it would cost that much. Is it not just copy and paste it in Survey Monkey? It's like, I, I almost had an attack because I didn't know how to yeah, respond how to, to that one. <laughs> Yeah, that, I, that's, I that's, usually, that's usually the conversation. That's usually the conversation that stops at that point, right? Um, because how do you respond to that? It's yeah, you can't. You can't do much. And in, in some respects, I feel you know uh, things are kind of uh, marching in reverse uh, because you know when I I started out in uh, in marketing research uh, more than thirty years ago, the product development was a was a core part of it. And uh, you would do focus groups. You would do, of course, there the U and A surveys, uh, and then uh, product tests. And then you would, you know, revisit uh, and sometimes do, you know, groups or surveys, uh, particularly groups on, um, you know, uh, on com competitor products and, and all that. The the issue was. Uh, particularly, you know, back in the '80s, uh, field work and everything. It just took so much time. Mm -hmm. uh, and of course, I, I should have mentioned the volumetrics in many cases, you know, we had bases and other types of, uh, of a few competitors to bases that were used to actually make uh, volumetric forecasts for certain types of products. Uh, and, and then, uh, you know, customer uh, satisfaction, you know, started to uh, emerge, I think, probably uh, big time in the in the early 80s. Uh, and that sort of, you know, Went on. But as you'd mentioned earlier, it was kind of a lot of that uh, lacked focus and, and really was not uh, was not done very well. Some was and some wasn't. Some was focused, you know, on, on an actual, you know, product itself or, you know, you know, with a banking experience, you know, with things that you like and whatnot. And what. But it's kind of like, you know, we, we, we seem to be going through a lot of the same stuff over and over again. And, you know, we now have more tech and different types of, of, of products happening. And we're running out of time here, too, as I think you got the, the notice. Uh, I was just clear, you know, curious where you think uh, uh, UX is, is heading from, from now Well, in the next few years. Mm -hmm. I think that UX, it will keep growing. We are in an experience economy, but experience is not about product experience only. Companies need to think of all the messages they are sending out explicitly and implicitly as part of the experience. In this moment, with so much social unrest in the middle of a pandemic around the world being broadcast through so many channels, users, customers, potential customers are watching how companies are responding, how the products and services reflect diversity and discrimination, how their internal company culture and purpose intersect with the customer mental models, which are the, expect the expectations, the, the frame of reference. If it is being predicted that user experience will be a key value driver and differentiator in the future economy, not only to acquire and retain customers, but also to acquire and retain talent, human capital. Again, the employee experience bleeds over the customer experience all the time in the products and services companies design and the way they communicate with customers in the advertising or through customer service or through the diversity of the suppliers they give business to. It is all part of the user experience. We just need to think of different user stakeholders, which is why there are some proponents of calling HX, which is the human experience. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, if we don't have more trained researchers dedicated to UX, the field may lose value to companies because over time the decisions won't be as effective for their business. So 
my hope is that more companies invest in research professionals and vendors that can increase the level of professionalism of the field. Okay, Dan, we have just a few minutes left. Do you have any uh, further questions for? Uh, yeah, I guess, well, a twist on, normally I ask all our guests a specific question, but I'm gonna twist it today. Uh, maybe you can just give us an idea of, when you think back to all the, you know, obviously years and great deal of work that you've done, what's uh, an example of a UX experience that you think was particularly bad or particularly good? You mean in terms of, of, a, of a company or a product or service? Yes, yes, yes. Well, there are, uh, unfortunately, there are, there are many. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure there are, yeah. <laughs> there are many out there. And one I can uh, refer to, it has to do with, it gives you a good example of how whatever communication with the company also premiates the, the user experience with the product. And it is about a customer service experience. A, a, company, a, a customer gets the wrong product. They call the company. The company doesn't respond. Mm. And the, the clients has to, the, the customer has to go to Twitter and complain. And then the partner which they, they, this is a promotion they got through a partner, right? And so mm. the partner is the one who responds. And just through that effect, two days later, the headquarters called the client, the customer and offered them the free product. So why would you have to go through all that mm. and ignore what is really happening is that you didn't meet, you know, the promise and it was all all really was rooted in a bad black print you know the the fine print sorry the fine print you know those little fi little letters the text that gives you the conditions that was really very confusing right. very very confusing they, if they have done some type of concept testing on that particular text they would have solved and understood what exactly are you saying and how people are interpreting this? You would have avoid the whole problem. You get bad PR, you got a partner angry, you end up having to get the, the, the highest management in the company involved for just handling one customer, right? Mm -hmm. And that customer still has a bad taste in her mouth because of this. Yeah, because of the experience itself, the resolution might be okay. They've got to free something, but it doesn't actually help you get over it, does it? And that's what we say, the customer experience, the user experience, the, it goes on, goes beyond the actual product. It, it touches, every time you are touched by the company for something, then you have an experience. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's really interesting to me. I always go back to those, um, uh, I worked once, I was in charge of doing the advertising in Asia for a very large hotel chain, global hotel chain. And I tried to explain to the client that when you send out those little surveys, you know, like two days afterwards, sort of like, thanks for, thanks for staying at our X hotel. Can you answer this survey? There's nothing on there that actually says, but I don't actually want to answer the survey. Um, <laughs> you know, as that. That's the most annoying part of the experience for me with these damn surveys they kept on sending. So um, we need the feedback, Dave. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. We need the feedback. Yeah. Thank. Yeah, it's been really interesting, Kevin. Yeah, yeah. Thanks so much. Uh, I wish we had another forty minutes, but unfortunately, we don't. Uh, uh, but really, we we appreciate your your insights, and uh, I think uh, our listeners will too. There's a lot of a lot of riches in there. Uh, and your experience comes through and uh, very clearly. And, you know, there are just a lot of very, you know, practical things that I think marketing researchers are, are frequently uh, missing. And you touched on part of that with the confusion uh, of agile over with, with speed and cost, mm -hmm. which is, uh, you know, not, not at all what it, uh, what it meant. But, but anyway, thanks again so much. Well, thank you. Thank you for the opportunity. I really enjoy it. And Kevin's right. I'm going to quote your how you described agile because it's fantastic. I just hate the way people automatically think it means just do it fast. Yeah, it's nuts. <laughs> yeah. <laughs>
Um, okay, that was really excellent. I, I really enjoyed that uh, hearing from you. And yeah, I'm going to get back for another conversation about some things at some stage. Thanks a lot. Okay, okay. thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. -bye.